الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد All praises due to Allah We ask Allah to exalt the mansion, grant peace and send his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم The schools of thought The schools of thought in Islam Where do we stand? We have with us our beloved Dr. Mamdouh Muhammad Welcome Dr. Sheikh Asim al-Hakim and uh, Sheikh Abdurrahim McCarthy. And we were discussing in a previous episode the issue of fatwa shopping. I don't know if you went shopping since, but can you elaborate more on fatwa shopping? What does shopping have to do with fatwa and how did these two come together in one word? So the fatwa shopping, which is the, when we say we want the people to explore, the danger is that when some people do now is they find the fatwa shopping. You mentioned the example in the last episode of smoking. So somebody wants to smoke, he's going to try to find, even though probably now there's really nobody who says it's halal. Even the ones who said it's mukru at first, now they know it causes cancer, it kills you. They now say it's haram. So you're rarely going to find any modern day scholar who would say it's mukru. So he might look for those old fatwas when it first came into the Islamic world that it's mukru. So he can keep smoking. It's not really haram. The funny thing is that you'll find scholars who would say, <laughs> who smoke themselves. Mm -hmm. And they say, listen, if it's haram, we're burning it. If it's halal, we're smoking it. So they play with words. Go ahead. Exactly. So this is the danger with talking about fatwa shopping. So they, people are actually, when we mean shopping, just like when you go shopping, you want to buy what you want. You go to the grocery store, you choose your product. You go to buy furniture, you choose the couch you want, the bedroom set you want. So the people are looking for the fatwa that suits them. And obviously there's going to be a lot of things that are not correct when they follow this. This is the danger of this. So what, what is the relationship with this to following the madahib or the schools of thought? is a lot of people are going to say that the, it's actually better somebody just follows a school of thought and relaxes. Because when you open up the door to look for what's more authentic, he could actually fall into balala, fall into that which is astray. So it's better for him just to follow one of these great imams, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed. Isn't it safer? Well, the lesson, I guess, would be then the sincerity of the believer. All, everything seems to revolve around the person. The core of the matter. Yeah, you can go fatwa shopping. I think in Arabic they call it tatabu al rukhas it's like people always looking for the concession. So, you know, if, if he doesn't agree with something, say, yeah, but this imam said it's okay, and I need it now, so I'll just act upon it. Uh, but if the person is sincere, they fear Allah, then I guess they will not be able to, to deal with it in this manner. Yeah, and this is something very important that we should develop and raise our kids and the Muslims to that. Do you want to please yourself, or do you want to please Allah? Do you want to be sincere? for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or you want to please yourself and to please your hawa and to please your nafs and to please the other people. If the Muslim is trained on this, I think we will have less problems in the future, inshallah. So I would never go shopping for a fatwa. I would ask the scholar, I would be very sincere in looking for a person, yes, to give me the fatwa that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to please myself. Well, I'm still waiting for the evidence, someone to cite an evidence from the Quran as why is it that we, you know, whenever we have all these people presenting their opinions and there's a, there's a conflict, there's one individual whom we are supposed to follow blindly. Can we uh, say that? It's true, but if I may comment a little bit further on the issue of uh, fatwa shopping. The problem is not with the students of knowledge, because wh who you're talking about with the intention are the students of knowledge. The problem is with the majority of the Muslims who are the laymen, who do pick what suits them. So they go to the four uh, schools of thought and they become selective and they should not because like Sheikh Abdurrahim said, if a person does not have the ability to select or, or to know, to verify which is authentic and which is not, then it's the safest thing for him is to follow one madhab. But when that person become selective in the sense that he says, listen, now marriage, I know it requires the approval of the guardian, it requires giving a dowry, it requires at least the presence of two witnesses. So if he becomes, if I meet someone at the university and I like her, she likes me, and I said, listen, according to Abu Hanifa, I don't have to seek your guardian's approval and you can marry yourself. And according to one of the madhabs of Imam Shafi, the presence of two witnesses is not required. And according in one saying or opinion in Madhab al Malik, dowry is not an issue. So how about it? She says, start tonight, right? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> right there. And, and we can tango. So 
Is this okay? Definitely not. This is manipulating, this is distorting Allah's religion. Allah Azza wa Jal, in the midst of all of these difference of opinions, gave us a strict and clear evidence. Allah says, whenever there's dispute, refer it back to Allah and His Messenger, meaning refer it back to the Quran and to the Sunnah. So this is the line that clears all dispute and is the line that we're supposed to follow. So it's more like we're supposed to submit to Allah through Islam, and it's like some people may want to make Islam submit to their choices. True. So they're, like, they're actually twisting around the very, the very essence of the religion. The four madhahib, I remember you mentioned before in, in the previous episode, they're Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Now, my understanding is that the four madhahib are primarily dealing with fiqh issues, jurisprudence. Now, how do we understand this in the light of aqidah? As in, could someone be a blind follower of one of the four madhahib, yet not have the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or once someone follows one of these Imams, then by you know, default, he is upon the aqidah, or is there a variation between these two? Because I am a student of knowledge, I will take it to a higher level to Sheikh McCarthy to answer this question. Be our guest. Uh, this question is very important, actually, what you mentioned, and this is something that always any, troubled me. I can't believe it when I travel around the Islamic world that you'll find somebody, and because these four imams, they didn't just go into issues of jurisprudence only. They went in depth into the aqidah. And you see the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah, it's the aqidah of these imams as well, that this is their beliefs. And there's no any, one or two slight differences maybe that they might have had on one issue with Abu Hanifa. Other than that, the issue of Iman, which is a, a small issue. It's rhetorical, it's, it's yeah, not yeah. actually when you come no, to no. So there's no really, if you look at there's no difference of opinion between them and the belief. Yet you'll find Muslims who have the audacity today to say, I'm a Maliki, I'm a Shafi'i, but they don't follow the aqidah. They don't follow the belief of these Imams, which is, it sounds kind of crazy. And when you go to the fiqh, they're really into it and they won't go away from it. I mean, I found one guy to the extent that he told me, the issue we talked about in the first episode about the water, and we showed him all of the scholars said these hadiths are not authentic. And he said, I will follow the madhab of Malik, even if it goes against the hadith. And I was like, wow, you know, I said this hadith. And we clearly showed it to him. He, he's the guy who studied Arabic and he studied the fiqh and he knew. He said, I will not leave the madhab. But when we came to the issues of aqidah, he said, I'm a shari. I'm not on the, he said, I don't follow the aqidah of Imam Malik. So I was like, you know, who is more knowledgeable in this issue? So that's a fatwa shopper. Exactly. In, in, a, goes, sense. Goes back to <laughs> in a sense. And then he says, my methodology and spiritualism is this tariqah or this way of this and that. So they follow all, it's, it's now become like three in one. SubhanAllah. It's, it, they've made a little trinity, right? When the, <laughs> when the, when the khair is there. We're running away from trinity. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reality is there. When you, I mean, who is better? Imam Malik or somebody else who came after him? And they're the ones who know the aqidah. They're the ones who know the correct aqidah. So all of them had the same belief. And, one of, and it's something very troubling how somebody can run away from that belief. Sheikh Asim, we want standardized answer for any individual who may push the following of one madhab blindly while excluding and ignoring everything else. What can we say to any person who says, no, you must follow the madhab or the opinion of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah or Imam Shafi rahimahullah or Malik or Imam Abu Hanifa? What is that one answer that we can say to all of them, which, if they were sincere, would satisfy them? Simply, to go back to the sources, to the fundamentals of any proper Muslim. Ask any individual, Akhi, who are you following? The Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet or X, Y, Z. Usually they will come with the argument of, okay, isn't Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal following the Quran and Sunnah? Right. So I'm following him. So no, actually you're following his understanding. But Allah Azza wa tells you in black and white in the Quran, وَيَوْمِ يُنَادِيهِمْ فَيَقُولْ مَاذَا أَجَبْتُمُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ the question that you'll be asked on the Day of Judgment, what did you respond to the messenger who came to you, the Prophet You're not going to be asked, what did Imam Malik or his students say, or what did Imam Hanifa and his two students say. You will be asked about your response to the Prophet And this is the question you're going to be asked in your grave. What did you do with what you knew? What did you do with following the Prophet ﷺ. Who's your Lord, who's your Prophet, and what is your religion? But also I see one of the problems here 
is following the one's own desire, and this is that makes people go and buy fatwa films. To the degree that uh, the Quran said something about this, that says that أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ فَأَضَ اللَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ So here the people, the, the verse means that some people take their desires and whims and make them their own gods because they follow their desires instead of following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. And this is the essence of Islam is to submit your desires, to submit yourself to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Submitting Islam is it's, Islam, this is submitting, it. right? As you mentioned it, it's not vice versa. It's not submitting Islam to your desires. So this is, this is a very important concept and I think we need to find a good uh, title for it, like shopping for fatwas. We need to, it's not submitting yourself to Allah, not submitting the religion to yourself. Right. Okay, well, I guess that will be something we could uh, discuss after the break, in fact. And uh, perhaps we can also deal with the issue of, for example, we can say to the person that your imam, who you're following blindly, who was he following? And if his objective was to lead you to the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, but do you say he did it 100% or did he fail sometimes? If you agree he wasn't masoom, he failed. Therefore, if you find another path, you should just go by the path. Maybe we can elaborate on that after the break, inshallah. The weather is nice, but the discussion is hot. We were dealing with the issue of kind of coming up with a slogan or a new expression as to the nature of the slave in Islam. What, what does he do and what is his role and does he make the religion submit to him or does he submit to the religion? And we were going to discuss, we said, also a standard answer which we can give in regards to those who are overly attached to the one opinion of the Imam. And so perhaps you can begin, Brother McCarthy, on this issue. Inshallah, before we go into that, I think we need to discuss a very important issue. And we, and the, it's interesting how many topics come up about this. It's a very interesting topic about the schools of thought, and there's so much to talk about. But we need to focus on finding the cure for a problem that we have in the Ummah today. And that is that we have basically two extremes. The true, true students of knowledge, they're always in the middle. And the correct path in Islam, wherever you look at anything, it's always in the middle. And we have some Muslims, even some who might be students of knowledge, who absolutely blind follow the madhab. Like we mentioned, the guy who said, I don't care about the hadith, I'm going to follow what I was taught in my madhab. And they, they don't care. And then you have another extreme, which actually has a form of hatred almost, if not a serious hatred for the imams. Yeah, I've come across a lot yeah, of you've that. you've seen it's this. very strange. And they actually look at the person who follows one of the imams as being like a muqtadir, as being someone who's an innovator in their religion. This is serious. So we have these two extremes. I think we need to talk about these, This is because we want to solve this problem. We want to, the ummah to come to the, the middle path on this. Right. This is a very important topic. Because now, when you look at the major scholars of Islam who studied, let's look at, for example, Imam Nawi, Imam Ibn Hajar, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, did any of them come up not studying a madhab? Initially, they must have had a madhab. All of them initially had it. So this was the proper methodology and being a student of knowledge. They studied these madhabs, all of them. You're not going to find Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, major scholars of Islam. They studied the madhab. And he... Do you then say they left one madhab or different No, no once they started off studying the madhab. Oh. This was the first step. And then they started to study after that, obviously, more madhabs. And to see the difference of opinions, and they would take that was correct and leave that was not correct. Like mujtahid? Yeah, yeah. But the he, even the student of knowledge, as we mentioned, who can filter, he can do that. But the point is, is that all of them took the path of studying the madhab. So it's nothing wrong. This is, we need to make it clear here. There's nothing wrong with studying a madhab. There's nothing wrong with studying it. What's wrong is the blind following. So we don't want to be the extreme where you say you can't study madhab because it's not the methodology of our scholars. You're going to try to get somewhere without going the proper way. All of the scholars went this way. So why would we choose another path? And that's why you find so many students of knowledge who try to go other than that path. Their knowledge is, it's, it's all mixed up, it's everywhere. But the ones who went the path of the scholars, they studied the madhab, and then after they learned it, they start to study other madhabs as well, look here and there. That was good for them. But we don't want to stay there at the blind following. You'll find people who have been studying 20, 30 years, and they will not leave what their imam said. And this is also very dangerous. So we need to always follow that middle path in all aspects of Islam. I think education solves some of these problems. Yeah. I remember that some people told me that who lived in, in Mecca, that uh, I think 70 years ago or so, they said that uh, at the time of Salat al-Dhuhr, you would hear 
the Adhan and uh, one person from Maliki would make the Adhan and only the Maliki people would pray. Was it that close there 70 years ago? Yes, it's approximately. Almost 70 it was years. Four, four, just 70 manhaj. years. And you see, nowadays, I, I still remember the Haram 30 years ago. Nothing like this happened. So in a very short time, this has changed. And this is in Mecca. The most, yes, the most sacred place in the world. And now nobody, nobody looks at that. You see and the difference this today. Changed, nobody... Yes. And I think the reason that this changed is the spread of correct knowledge. And I think even these two episodes that we have done about this topic will affect many people in the world, inshallah, and will make them try to look for, yes. And I like what you said that when we are asked in our graves about the three questions, who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is the prophet who was sent to you? You, you your mom's not in that one? Yeah. This is exactly what is I wanted to know. So here, there's no question that will be asked, who is your imam? Or what's your mother? Every Muslim should be aware of that. You're not going to be asked about this. These are only the three questions that you're going to be asked. So why worry about the issue of an imam now or a madhab now? So I should focus on the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here, other than focusing on other. Abu Musab. If you allow me. Yes, I do. What concerns me most is not the fiqh issues regarding to school of thought. So I can understand the difference is there. And I respect people who differ with me. So for example, I see that a woman should cover her face. But if I see someone who follows the other opinion, I'm okay with that because he's following what his conviction applies to him. The biggest problem is with the blind followers of Imams of Dalala, Imams of the wrong path, deviant Imams. When you find the masses of the Muslims, and this brings me to Dr. Mahmoud's point of education. You find educated people, PhD holders, doctors, engineers, blindly following a deviant Imam. An Imam that says, for example, I see the Prophet ﷺ alive 10 times a day. What is this? He prays in Mecca, his five-day prayers. One of the imams claimed to that to go, he went on Hajj and came the same night. Yeah, what is this? He, no, 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 very recently somebody said that I talked to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over the phone. One, this is very one, recent. Even more ridiculously, one yes, was saying ridiculous. that he saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he spoke to him and he cried saying that the people of the country he was in refused to give him a ticket to go back. Wallahi, this was, is this Oh you? yeah, yeah, I heard. This is <laughs> pathetic. Yani and you find people blindly following this person. So whether you put your hand on your chest or you don't put your hand in prayer, this is nothing. This is part of the sunnah. If your prayer is, is valid. Now, when it comes to aqidah, when it comes to your belief and claiming to follow a school of thought, or I don't, I would not consider it's this not to be a school of thought. A, a school of thought. It's a, a school it, of deviant thought. Yes. This so, is gen this is. Paradise or Hellfire is it revolves oh, yeah, around this, this one here. So this is the key. The aqidah is the key issue. So this is why we call the Muslims to purify their aqidah and to learn their religion, not from Tom, Dick, or Harry, to learn their religion from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and on the understanding of the companions and the righteous scholars. May Allah be pleased with them. Right. By this, you are definitely following the footsteps of the Prophet. These things exist. So it seems that the schools of thought have went beyond the four schools of thought. And now we have all kinds of uh, schools of thought, which is not the standard things of the four Imams. We have all kinds of people. So people are going astray in all directions. It's not only that. See, they bank on the reputation of the four Imam. And that it's, is it why, sells, right? yes, they're deviant. So they can't say that I'm following this school of thought or that. So they claim that I'm following this particular school of thought of the four widely accepted schools of thought, and they invest it with their own corrupt ideas. And they say their deviant ideology. They say, okay, the, the usual answer is, but everyone is doing it. You guys are, are a bunch of extremists. Who is everyone? everyone we is are doing not doing it. it. Is, there an answer, <laughs> is there an answer for those who say everyone? Like when it comes to numbers majority versus minority. Do you have anything from the Quran and the Sunnah which addresses the issue of numbers, whether they do make a difference? Yes. I mean, I think one of the verses that I recall from the Quran, If you follow the majority of the people on the earth, they would have deviated you. 
It's not by the majority. Is the what in total? أكثر من في الأرض. ما in total أكثر من في الأرض. يضلوك عن سبيل الله. يضلوك عن سبيل الله. So if you follow the majority of the people on the earth on the planet, they will deviate you. So the majority. So the majority is not is not a ruling in Islam. The Prophet said in the famous hadith when he said, "On the day of judgment, there will come a prophet." Pay attention to this: a prophet who has been chosen by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, who will have maybe two people with him, will have one person, and will have nobody with him. Profit. So in the number games, it's a joke. It doesn't matter about the numbers. It matters about the quality. The quality. I remember one of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah was using very simple techniques to convince those people who would say that I am a Shafi'i or I am Hanbali or I am. So he used to say that I have a simple question for you. If you answer it, you will know. Was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Shafi'i? Was the Prophet Hanbali? Or and the answer all the time is no and no and no and. So if the Prophet ﷺ is none of these, so why do you want to be a follower of someone? And you have the original one that you can follow very easily. And if we the go Prophet back to the, to the early history of Islam, it was something you have to do. If you go astray, if you don't follow one of these imams, it's back to the issue of is, is it wajib? Do we have to do it? What about the early Muslims before the time of these Companion. four imams? What about them? Were they all sinners? Were they all astray? With this? Obviously, they didn't have it. And as Sheikh Asim mentioned before, there was a lot of schools of thought. We have had they need the same amount of knowledge, but the, the students they have are the ones who spread it. The point is, is that, and he found these. We want to focus on this. And these are some of the greatest scholars of Islam. We have to have love as Ahl Sunnah, as the people of the Sunnah, for Imam Abu Hanifa. We have to have love for Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmed. And we have to have hatred for those who hate them. Because they were the ones who strove night and day to spread the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. And we do have it. Yeah, we have, have, we have the love for all the All of them. No, no, no difference. We don't, and he, you'll find people, and he, it came to the time, not just the, you mentioned about the, the different jama'at, the different groups who used to pray in the haram. Even the marriage. You remember these stories that you were not allowed to marry if you were Hanifi to marry from oh, a yeah. shafi. Yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, these days, as you say, alhamdulillah, with education and the more authentic knowledge that is spreading, alhamdulillah, these things are starting to doubt in the ummah. This is good. That doesn't mean we want to put away the, these madha. So we need we, them. We're not going to get to understand the Quran and without them. But also, alhamdulillah, we need to continue on this path we're going with not blind following them or making it a war between ourselves if you follow a different school of thought than me. Well, I couldn't have said it better. And uh, therefore, that concludes our discussion. I hope, inshallah, there was a benefit. In fact, uh, I feel that there was a benefit. And we addressed the issue pretty objectively by Allah's grace and mercy. And so we thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you, inshallah ta'ala, in the next episode. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa